Okay, well, uh, I want to thank Dan for the invitation for the departments here uh, for hosting me. I've had a great time meeting uh, faculty and students around uh, the university today, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So the talk I'm giving today is uh, looking at ecological subsidies uh, as a framework for assessing contaminant, fate, transport, and exposure across ecosystem boundaries. And I want to start with, uh, that's generally true, but getting better, and that is the ecotoxicology and ecosystems ecology still remain poorly integrated. And I have a definition of ecotoxicology on the left and ecosystems toxicology on the right. There's a lot of words in there, but it, in general, the emphasis of ecotoxicology is studying the toxic effects to things that live in ecosystems of contaminants, whereas ecosystems ecology is interested in the interaction between the biotic and abiotic parts of ecosystems, and those include chemicals, but ecologists don't typically study contaminants, they study other chemicals. And these different foci of the two fields has sort of kept them in their own silos. And this is important um, uh, because ecosystem ecology is increasingly recognizing that um, they should not be studied separately, that contaminants are an inevitable part of the mix. And this is from a, a really important paper that was published by Emily Burke, Bernhardt and her colleagues in, pretty recently in 2017. And over on the left, they plot uh, human alterations of ecosystems for things like nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, that have been increasing exponentially. Uh, and ecologists have been all over studying those things, and along with things like changes in CO2, land use conversion, uh, and those types of impacts, and how those affect ecosystem functions and things like biodiversity. Uh, but the point of this paper was, you know, hey, let's look at the patterns in the production and global uh, economic importance of things like pesticides and pharmaceuticals. And they show a similar trend in terms of they are exponentially increasing in terms of their release to the environment. And yet, ecosystem ecology and ecotoxicology remain separated. And so there's a growing recognition that we need to study these together. And this field that we're sort of calling contaminant ecology has been emerging. And it's really important at, at bridging these two separate tracks that people are, have been running on. And so, the, I want to talk about the system I work in, for the most part, uh, as a model system for, for integrating these two fields. Uh, and this is a, a very famous uh, uh, a graphic from a paper by Colden Baxter on uh, reciprocal subsidies between freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems. And so I like to shorthand this by saying that streams and lakes are bug factories. That they, they package the solutes, organic matter, and nutrients from the watershed and turn those into insect bodies. And those insect bodies feed many animals on land, as you can see from these arrows going out. So ecologists call that ecological subsidies, which is, I shorthand is the one ecosystem is feeding uh, its neighboring ecosystem. And ecologists have been studying this for 25 years, uh, as, uh, particularly freshwater ecologists. So these insects are providing an ecosystem service, feeding things on land. Uh, things that we care about, like birds and bats, for example. But freshwaters also, because they sit low in, the, low in the landscape, they also collect contaminants. And those contaminants can accumulate in insect bodies and hitch a ride on them when they emerge uh, to fly away to reproduce as winged adults. And so this is uh, what we refer to as the dark side of subsidies. So with this in mind, we sort of, uh, myself and my colleagues have developed this uh, framework for integrating these disciplines uh, based upon subsidies research. So uh, over on the left, for example, I can put on my ecology hat and say, ooh, I'm interested in food web dynamics um, and animal movement. And if the ecosystem I'm interested in has contaminants in it that are not toxic to the animals that are moving, when those animals like insects move, they are a subsidy that can drive exposure in that recipient ecosystem. Uh, now, if I put on my ecotox hat and I'm interested in fate, exposure, and effects of contaminants, if I'm studying an aquatic system that's contaminated with things that are toxic to insects, the contamination in that ecosystem can actually be cutting off the flow of animals. So that's a case where you have exposure in one ecosystem that's controlling the subsidy 
to its neighbor. So on the top half of the graph, I think of that as lower prey quality, maybe poisonous prey. And the bottom half, we, I consider to be lower prey quantity, a loss of biomass that would otherwise be feeding those predators. So I want to give you an example of a couple of these uh, different sort of this dichotomy. So this is from a study we did looking at aquatic insects uh, or uh, PCB contamination in this diverse riparian predator community in a stream in uh, South Carolina that was a Superfund site contaminated with PCBs. And the Southeast is extremely diverse uh, in terms of the fishes that live and animals that live in streams and the ones that live next to streams. I've just got a, a sort of a pictograph here of the riparian predator community. And when we started going out there sampling, we're like, well, who, who's going to be contaminated? And so we started thinking about traits of these animals. And they, they're, they're very diverse. And so you have some things like this long-jawed spider that I'll be talking about quite a bit today. And it, it is an obligate riparian species, meaning it lives next to the water and it specializes in aquatic prey. And then from there, you have things that live next to the water, but maybe eat a mix of prey. Uh, most of these herp, herp tiles are very generalized in terms of their habitat use and their prey diversity. And so we were thinking, well, maybe your dependence upon riparian sources will drive your uh, PCB exposure. And so what we did was we built uh, use stabilized topes to build these very simple food web maps and I don't know how familiar this group is with uh, these, but the shorthand is the carbon isotope uh, is an indicator of what you eat, and the nitrogen isotope is an indicator of how high up in the food web you eat. And so here is a very simple version of the aquatic food web with detritus, algae, insects, and fish. And then we mapped on that all of the critters that I just showed you that live in the riparian zone. And um, the long-jawed spider I mentioned, as you can see here, is plotting inside the aquatic food web. Basically, this is a fish crawling around on a bush and because it's totally reliant on insects leaving the water. And then we see this sort of this comet, the schmear of other uh, insect predators that are plotting further and further away from the stream food web. So we thought, hmm, okay, then things that are close, plotting closer to the aquatic food web should be more contaminated than things that are plotting farther from, from that stream food web. And when we um, uh, plotted carbon against, or, or this is the carbon isotope against PCBs in the, uh, the tissues of those animals, there was a very strong negative relationship. And so the little, uh, what this supported the hypothesis that the more aquatic carbon in the form of bug meat that went into building your body, the higher your PCB concentration is. So this is a pretty clear example of the subsidy, the aquatic insect driving exposure in that predator community. Now I'm going to give you an example of the flip side where we're losing biomass, where exposure is driving the subsidy. And this is work led by my colleagues Joanna Krauss and Travis Schmidt at USGS and uh, in metal impacted streams in the Colorado Mineral Belt. So this map shows um, uh, basically, this is the Continental Divide running north-south through Colorado. There are literally tens of thousands of abandoned mines uh, on this landscape, so streams are heavily impacted by metals, and um, metals are very toxic to insects. Across these sites, metal concentrations were hugely variable. Each one of these dots on the screen, I can't see how, I guess those are showing up pretty good. Um, each one of those dots represents a, one of the study sites, and the color codes indicate uh, pretty clean to pretty well nuked. And so metals are varying about four or five orders of magnitude in, in aqueous concentration across these sites. And we went, what Travis did was measure insect larval density, so that's the number of bugs per square meter of the bottom of the stream. And then Joanna went out and measured uh, adult aquatic insect emergence at a subsite, subset of these sites. So when, um, here's the, the larval insect data. And just a couple of things here on the x-axis are bioavailable metals in stream uh, on a log scale. And the y-axis is EPT density. And that, for shorthand, I would just call that the density of aquatic insects that tend to be sensitive to metals. And so each one of these dots shown here is one of the sites. 
and uh, the red line is called the, is the aquatic life criteria, and this is the, the benchmark set by EPA in the state of Colorado that says metal concentrations below that line shouldn't hurt uh, aquatic insect larvae. Above the line, you might be having a problem, and the, and the data show that very clearly is there very little change in the density of these insects until you hit that aquatic life criteria concentration, and then they just, the larval insect po population just crashes. So as a stream ecologist, I would say there's got to be a direct relationship between the number of bugs that live in the stream and the number of bugs that leave the stream. So we would assume insect emergence would sort of track that pattern. But when we got the emergence data back, it turns out that aquatic insect emergence was declining by more than an order of magnitude before you got to that threshold. And then out here, where you still have insect larvae living in the stream, almost nothing is leaving the stream. So here's a case where uh, metal concentration in the stream is cutting off that supply of food leaving the stream. And what are the consequences, or what are the actual numbers of how big was this impact on the loss of uh, adult insect biomass? And so on these graphs, uh, we have bioavailable metals in streams uh, along the y or x axis, and this is the amount of, of in adult insect biomass uh, in milligrams leaving the streams, uh, I think, on a, on a daily basis. And so what this shows is that when we looked at all insects, oh, and again, this red circle here is the aquatic life criteria. So if, if we look at all insects combined, we see these big declines uh, before we get to aquatic life criteria. Uh, mayflies, which are quite sensitive, uh, completely crash uh, about at the uh, aquatic life criteria, and even um, the more, much more sensitive midges are showing these strong declines. And what this added up to was a 97% of adult insect biomass loss across the gradient. Uh, mayflies, again, completely collapsed down to zero. Oops, and I'm hmm, not sure what happened there. Oh, I hit the up button, sorry. And even amongst the, uh, the more tolerant midges, there was an 88% decline uh, in biomass leaving the stream. And so what this turns into is the starvation effect. Less prey equals fewer spiders. So this is a uh, long-jawed spider uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a real uh, specialist in terms of feeding on aquatic insects. Uh, this is an electron micrograph of its horrible face uh, with its beady little eyes and its name for these uh, just terrifying long jaws. And over here on the graph, we have aquatic diptera flux. So that's the, the biomass of, dip, of midges leaving the stream. And on the y-axis, we have the biomass of spiders and the density of spiders in these two panels. And here, uh, the metal concentration is actually going uh, to the left. So where we have low uh, midge emergence, we have high metals. And there was a 75% decline in um, spider density along this metal gradient because they didn't have food, okay? And these, are, these guys specialize in eating aqua, aquatic insects, so there just wasn't enough there to support um, a, 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 a spider population like we find at the cleaner sites. So now that I've sort of shown you like the flip side of less prey versus toxic prey, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the organismal processes that are driving these patterns that we found on the landscape. Um, and the first one is the subsidy drive exposure is driven in, to a large part by the dynamics of uptake and elimination of contaminants across life history. And then the exposure driving subsidy part, I'm gonna show you an example of changes in contaminant toxicity across life history. All right, so I'm gonna take some time to walk through this graph. Uh, this is from a meta-analysis that uh, Joanna Krauss led and what we did was we looked at every study from the lab or the field where they had measured concentration of a chemical in the larvae and the adults. So we had these paired measurements. Each dot along this graph is a different contaminant. We calculated the ratio of the concentration in the adult to the concentration in the larvae. And the important thing here is at the one line, the concentrations are the same in the larvae and the adult. Anything above the line, the concentration's higher in the, 
adult below the line is higher in the larvae. So most of the, and these are different kind of contaminants. So we had essential and non-essential met, uh, metals, uh, some kind of classic or, uh, legacy organics and pesticides and uh, PAHs, which are aromatic hydrocarbons, so petroleum products. And what we found was things above the line tended to be these legacy organics like PCBs and DDT. And the, the reason the concentration is higher in adults than it is in larvae is because the way we, cancel, we calculate concentration is based on the mass of the animal. These contaminants are hydrophobic lipid fillets. So they're stored in the lipids of these insects. Most of these insects don't feed as adults. Um, and, and so they're very greedy about their lipids. And when insects go through metamorphosis, they lose weight because they, they take off their exoskeleton and fly away. So if you're losing weight, keeping all your contaminants in the fat stored in your body, the concentration has to go up. On the other hand, things like, that are toxic to insects like uh, metals and PAHs, if the insect can live through metamorphosis, it finds a way to get rid of them, either through excretion or, sh or storing it in the exuvia and shedding it. So I think as, w when, when I'm thinking about being an ecotoxicologist, we think, oh, chemicals affect animals, and it's important to remember that animals affect chemistry as well. All right. So why would, why would this, uh, going back to this graph, what, what would explain this disconnect between larval density in the stream and adult emergence? And uh, Jeff Wessner, who led this part, came up with a stressful metamorph metamorphosis hypothesis where for a larvae to live in a toxic environment full of metals, it has to do what we call detoxification, which is shown down here in this cartoon. And we don't need to know the details here. All you need to know is detoxification is hard. It takes energy for that animal to process metals and basically store it in the parts of its body will do the least amount of harm. So it's kind of like being sick all the time. You're living, but you're spending a lot of energy, right? Well, metamorphosis is hard too. For these insects to cross this water barrier, they have to totally reorganize their bodies they have to go from having gills and breathing water, uh, uh, getting oxygen out of water to having lungs. They have to hold their breath up to hours. So it's a very extreme, physiological, a very, physiologically a very stressful short period of their life. And so the thought here was emergence is reduced because mortality is increasing directly during this very short window of the animal's life because these two stressful things are synergistic or cumulative. And we tested this in the laboratory with this uh, mayfly. And what we did was exposed uh, mayfly larvae to zinc and then looked at different levels of mortality across life stages. Um, I'll show you this in a minute, but these mayflies have four life stages. This is the larval life stage. Here's our aquatic life criteria again for zinc. And you can see by this flat line, there was no effect of zinc toxicity on larvae across this metal gradient, even above the aquatic life criteria. They're managing, they're doing just fine. But then we looked at the other life stages. Uh, this is the pre-emergent nymph. So the day before it, these, these larvae emerge from the stream, they develop these wing pads so that they can uh, fly away. Then the, there's a sub-adult form that is terrestrial, but it's not yet fully uh, uh, sexually reproductive. Then it molts again. So these three life stages are plotted here on this graph. Here's the aquatic life criteria again. And even at the, the, this aquatic stage here, you're starting to see declines up to the aquatic life criteria and then a complete collapse. And remember the larvae were flat across here. So you're seeing this collapse uh, um, at the stage of the insect's life right where metamorphosis begins. Uh, this is the, the first stage that leaves the water. Again, similarly, total, you know, a, a very precipitous collapse. And then the final adult stage after a molt they basically, just above the aquatic life criteria, they're reduced to zero. So some of these changes, and th this is the percent, uh, percent surviving at the aquatic life criteria. By the time you get to this last life stage, only about a quarter of those are surviving, even though the larvae were doing just fine. All right. So I've talked a lot about uh, this model that includes aquatic insects. But is this really just an insect thing? What about some other creatures? 
uh, where we're seeing you know, patterns that can be ascribed to these processes. So amphibians have complex life histories too. Uh, this is a study that we did looking at chorus frogs in subalpine ponds in Colorado at 10,000 feet. That it is a very cold place. And this chorus frog, these adults hibernate for seven or eight months. So they spend two thirds of their life sleeping, which is kind of remarkable. And as soon as these ponds, uh, as soon as ice off, which is usually probably April or May, these frogs come out of hibernation and go to these ponds to breed. Um, after they breed, they, they hang out around these ponds and feed for three or four months to provision for the next cycle of hibernation. The tadpoles are, uh, uh, they're grazers, so they eat diatoms and detritus in these ponds and they have a really quick development time, eight to 10 weeks, because the, it's the window for them to get out before it starts snowing again is quite short. And, and here's an interesting thing. Here's the tadpole, here's the metamorph. When they go through metamorphosis and leave the water, they lose a third to half of their body mass. It's just a remarkable transformation in a short period of time. Uh, and, and these guys, you can still see the tail on here. They don't feed. Um, when they go through this, this process, just like um, I was, I think I mentioned that about the insect, until their tail is totally resorbed, um, they're not eating. So they're not taking on any new outside sources of, of chemicals. And then these metamorphs hop away, not to be seen again through marking studies, and they return to spawn after, or, or uh, breed after two or three years. So that's a you know, pretty complicated life history, pretty remarkable. And we looked at mercury, methyl mercury concentrations across these life stages. Methyl mercury is a quite uh, toc uh, it's a neurotoxin. It's one of the more poisonous things that we have in the environment. And the top graph here shows mercury concentrations for these different life stages, and I'll go through that. And that but I, what I really want to focus on is the cartoon, so we don't spend too much time staring at data. So we have the midsummer adult. Um, and this is at the end of the growing season, uh, and then the the breeding adult is at the, uh, the end of hibernation, the beginning of the breeding season, and then they lay the eggs, which turn into tadpoles and go through metamorphosis. And, and the point of this is that I'm, I'm gonna start here with the midsummer adult. This guy hops away, comes back eight months later, and its merc methyl mercury concentration has doubled. So this frog spent eight months under the snow respiring itself. It had nothing else to eat. So it's eating itself, but it cannot respire methylmercury. So as it's losing its mass, losing its stores, the mercury concentrations double. Uh, then there's a little bit of transfer to the eggs, and then the tadpoles start eating, and then the magic shrinking tadpole that turns into this little tiny thing, the mercury concentrations double again. And so this, is, uh, this biological process is called catabolism, which literally means eating yourself. And that leads to this bioamplification of methylmercury. So this is not biomagnification. These two life stages are not eating. It is just the internal dose is increasing because they're shrinking and, 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 and respiring themselves. So what does that mean? So let's talk about exposure energetics uh, and put this in the context of what I like to call the bright side and the dark side of subsidies. So getting away from concentra concentrations for a minute, which is the way we usually think about exposure, is what is the dose in my food, which is measured in milligrams per kilogram, something like that. It is the amount of contamination in the mass of the organism. But let's think about this from a, the, the perspective of the predator of these, of these animals. So great blue herons would feed on all of these life stages. And what we did was we measured the gross energy expressed here in calories per gram of each life stage. Here's the, the midsummer adult, the breeding adult, tadpoles, and metamorphs. The important thing about this graph is that, let's remember their life history for a minute. The highest uh, calories per gram are in this midsummer adult. And what has that animal been doing? It's been sitting around that wetland for three or four months, eating like crazy because it's got to go sleep for eight months. So it is just provisioning, it's holding on to everything it can. So it's just plumped up juicy thing. And then it goes away, 
and it comes back eight months later, and it's lost, even though it's not a statistical difference, it's lost a lot of calories. And so I like to think about this, I imagine an orange. And so at the end of the summer, this is a big juicy orange, and when it comes back to breed, it's like you've squeezed all the juice out of the orange and you're just left with the rind, okay? And then um, these other life stages are lower in caloric content. But let's talk about this from the predator's perspective. And here we expressed the mercury concentration not by the mass of the animal, but by the energy that animal is, is giving the predator. So this is the amount of mercury per nanograms of calorie. And what you can see here is that it makes a huge difference to the exposure of the predator which life stage it's eating. So if it's eating that squeezed out orange where the mercury has doubled, it's getting the highest dose of mercury for the same unit of, of calorie, right? So let's look at it this way. Oops, went backwards. This bird should be eating tadpoles because it's getting the same amount of injury for a tadpole but five times less mercury dose than it's getting if it just eats the adults that come back after hibernating. So life history matters and, we're, and the feeding behavior of the predator matters as well. So I just want to wrap that up and say that life history, it, it, it really affects the exposure regimes for the animal that we're interested in and their predators. And so here's my cartoon again showing that mercury is doubling during hibernation and doubling again during metamorphosis. So we call that in vivo exposure. So the amount of mercury inside that animal that is poisoning it potentially is doubling during stressful periods of its life. When it's coming out of hibernation after being asleep for eight months, there's nothing to eat yet, there's no bugs flying around, and it's gotta go through this incredibly stressful event, totally energy um, intensive event of breeding. Uh, metamorphosis is a very important time for early brain development of, of, of these animals. And so the idea that your contaminant load is doubling when you're struggling the most, I think is really important for the exposures these animals experience in the environment. And the predator does very usually, as I just showed you, uh, across prey life stages. So in terms of thinking about this in, from a cost-benefit analysis, it, I, it's not just the, the tissue concentration in the animal, it's the energetics. How much exposure is that predator getting for the amount of energy it's getting to go about its daily business? All right. Let's check the time here real quick. I think I'm doing all right. All right. So everything I've talked about today is, uh, you know, me wading around in these little ponds or slopping around these little streams, picking up little tiny things. And what about other systems and creatures and other scales and processes? You know, how can we apply sort of these models to whole different ecosystems? And here's something that people care about, salmon. Every year, millions of Pacific salmon return to fresh waters of North America, and they transport unknown quantities of nutrients and contaminants with them. And while we know that they, trans that they do transport these, we hadn't really added it up and thought about it as how, what is going on at the scale of the continent? How big of, of, of a flux are these things? And this is work led by Jess Brandt and, uh, at UConn and Jeff Wessner at the University of South Dakota. So a little bit uh, about the salmon uh, life history. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with this. So the salmon come into freshwater to spawn as adults. These die, and then they go through various life stages of eggs and, and, and uh, fry, and eventually they turn into smolts, and they swim out to the ocean where they live for anywhere from like two to seven years. And while they're in the ocean, they basically put on close to 100% of their biomass, right? And then they return to freshwater to spawn. I just want to get this definition out there. This uh, uh, is uh, from the fisheries world. Ones that are returning to freshwater is referred to as escapement. And it means that they have escaped predation in the wild and commercial fisheries in the ocean. And then they come and they, uh, again, so they, this is them. This is the point where they return to North America and swim upstream with everything that they have ever accumulated in their body while they were living in the ocean. 
I want to get back to this sort of dichotomy and perspectives between ecologists and ecotoxicologists now for a second. Ecologists have been studying this for four or five decades, and they love this story of salmon basically collect a bunch of fertilizer in their bodies while they live in the ocean, and then they bring that to fresh water, and from the minute they enter fresh water and start excreting and to the, mint, to the end when they're just a big bag of bones, they are feeding that forest. They are feeding those bears and they are feeding those rivers. They're like fertilizer and they drive all sorts of ecosystem processes. Fascinating. But then <laughs> toxicologists got involved and they're like, well, hey, hold on. These salmon also have accumulated contaminants in that marine environment and they publish all these papers and they're like, oh no, salmon poison rivers, forests, and bears and toxins are bad. So that's the dark side of subsidies versus the bright side of subsidies. And um, so how can we start thinking about integrating these concepts to give a more holistic view of what these salmon are actually doing when they come back to North America? So how do you do that? First of all, 123 million Pacific salmon per year escape to the freshwater spawning grounds of North America. And that's just a mind boggling number. We looked at these five species of what we call semi-peril, semi-perils, semi-perils, help me out, Kevin. Okay. <laughs> these are the five species that return to fresh water and die and rot. Some salmon like salmonids like steelhead might come and spawn and return to the ocean. So we're not gonna count those. Okay, so these five species leave the Pacific. They come to all these spawning grounds in North America. So they're spread out over a huge area. And this is the only math that, that I'm gonna talk about today, I hope, is how do we calculate the subsidy flux? And this is the number of fish, that's the escapement, times the body size of that fish, times the concentration of things in that fish. So this is ecosystem math. If you can add, multiply, and sometimes, if you subtract and maybe divide, you too can calculate fluxes. The modeling of these fluxes was a little difficult, but I'm gonna to try to kind of gloss over that today, but this is how we calculate how much stuff leaves the ocean and comes to the continent. So we have some you know, pretty straightforward research questions. The first is, what are the magnitude of continental scale marine to freshwater fluxes? This is a real first principle kind of question. How much stuff do they bring? And so we looked at four different nutrients that we had good data for, nitrogen, phosphorus, two fatty acids, and four contaminants that we had good data for. These are uh, persistent, bicumulative, and toxic contaminants, mercury, PCBs, PBDEs, which are flame retardants, and DDT, which is your classic legacy pesticide. And what we were interested in is not only how much stuff is it, but how has it changed, how have these fluxes changed over time as salmon communities have changed over time? So we looked at the escapement runs times fish sizes, as I mentioned before, to calculate the total escapement biomass per species per year. So I'm gonna shorthand that. How much salmon meat leaves the ocean and comes back to the continent? And we did it for 40 years, from 1976 to 2015. We have escapement data that goes back further, but we have very little contaminant data. Uh, and some of these contaminants weren't even around before then. So we have this 40 year window where we're very, pretty confident. And then finally, you know, to get back to sort of that, that first slide I showed about the different perspectives of ecologists and toxicologists, are these individual species providing a disproport or dis disproportionately delivering a brighter side versus darker side subsidies? So trying to do this sort of more integrated perspective. The reason we, were, we thought this might be interesting is that Pacific salmon occupy distinct trophic positions. So they feed relatively higher or lower in the food web. Some are planktivorous, some eat fish. And contaminants biomagnify, but nutrients typically do not. So we thought there might be some big differences there that would control sort of the, the, the nutrient versus contaminant profile. So how much stuff? Pacific salmon move metric tons of nutrients and kilograms of contaminants. So if you notice the scale over here, here, here's our four nutrients. This is in thousands of metric tons, and this is in single kilograms. 
I can't think in terms of metric tons, and so I need a visual. And <laughs> this is 67 blue whales, <laughs> the largest animal ever to, to live on Earth, and this is 7,000 thermometers. Now, that is, that's a lot of thermometers. It's not trivial, but how bad is it? And the reason I'm bringing up this different in scales here is that if we want to say integrate this concept of is it a bright side or a dark side or, or somewhere in the middle, at some point we're going to have to tackle the math here of getting these things on the same scale. And this was a challenge when you're dealing with thermometers and whales. <laughs> Which salmon matter? Same graph, three salmon species, pink, sockeye, and chum are doing 90% of the work. All right. Chinook and coho, even though they're large, their numbers are, are relatively low, they're bringing about 10% of stuff back from the ocean. And, and that'll be, this, this is important because this sets up how the changes in communities change fluxes over time and change this sort of uh, bright side, dark side uh, perspective. So this slide has a lot going on, but all this slide shows is how communities have changed over time and how that's affected the biomasses and fluxes that we're interested in. So across the uh, x-axis for all these is years. So this is that 40-year time frame. Uh, and starting on the left is individual biomass of fish. And the take-home message is shown up here at the top. Over 40 years, all of these animals shrunk while their abundance increased. But pink salmon in particular totally boom over that time period. So I'm gonna go through each of these panels to drive those points home. So this is the individual body size of fish in kilograms over time. The largest fish is Chinook. They declined by a third over that 40 year time frame. And I can tell you the fisheries folks are not happy about this. Uh, all, of the, all of them just declined and pink salmon are the smallest and yet they also declined by about 15%. So that's not a trivial loss of size over a 40 year time period. Now in this next panel, we have abundance. And uh, I believe that, I can't see it on my screen. I think that's in millions. Okay. Abundance in millions. All of the salmon increased, but again, the pinks really boomed. Their population, their escapement population increased by 61 million fish over the 40 year time period, which is remarkable. Now, we get to the total escapement in metric tons per year. Remember, so this is the total amount of salmon meat that swims onto the continent. If you add all the species up, the total escapement increased by 73,000 metric tons, 40% over that time frame. That's a lot of salmon meat. And then when we break that down into the individual species, so this is the same thing, metric tons per year, they all go up a little bit, but pink salmon, biomass returning to land, increased by 60,000 metric tons. So most of the change we saw in the community over time is attributed to this one species. Now remember, these animals, all of their bodies shrunk, uh, and it was proposed uh, in this uh, recent Nature article, which is quite good, they, they, who reported this shrinking, they suspected, they hypothesized that shrinking bodies might be related to reduced subsidies. But in terms of the total amount of salmon meat returning to land, this 15% decline in body size was totally offset by this 61 million uh, uh, population increase. So you wind up with this actually 60,000 metric tons increase. And even though they're all shrinking, 73,000 metric ton increase in the total amount of salmon coming, uh, returning home to spawn. So now we've, we've mapped out how much salmon meat's coming back to the continent. What does that mean in terms of subsidy fluxes? So I'm gonna show, I'm gonna break this down with this first panel and then show you all the panels. But as you would guess from that last slide, everything increased because more salmon, or, or more salmon mass is returned to the continent. So on the, on the top row of these panels is going to be uh, the total export of nutrients in, in kilograms and the bottom panel is gonna be contaminants in kilograms and, and with the years across the bottom. In each one of these panels, we have the sum of all species at the top and then um, 
the, uh, the trends for the individual species. So without oh, getting down too far into the weeds, I'll just summarize this for all the contaminants and nutrients. And nutrients increase the most uh, from between 22% to 31%. Uh, for fatty acids and, and uh, nutrients like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. All of the contaminants increased as well, but to a lesser extent, from between 17 to about 29%. And the thing about all of these, most of these graphs is the increase in almost everything is attributable to that huge boom in pink biomass returning to the continent. And um, it's a little hard to see on these, but the one thing uh, you can see is the pink is usually at the top, but the slopes of those lines are usually steeper. And that's why they're having the biggest influence on these total changes in subsidies across, uh, across uh, time and species. Now we're gonna get into, all right, so now we've, 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 we've seen how things have, we've seen the total amount of stuff, we've seen how it's changed over time, and now let's try to sort of integrate these two, this ecological and toxicological perspective to see our individuals, species disproportionately delivered this brighter side or darker side subsidy profile. Nutrient contaminant profiles vary according to species specific contaminants, but especially contaminants, or species specific characteristics, sorry, but it's especially the contaminants. So over here on the left, we have this carbon and nitrogen food web and on the bottom graph, we have the species across the bottom, and on the y-axis, this is trophic level. So this is trophic level is how high up in the food web do you feed? Uh, pink salmon mainly eat uh, invertebrates like zooplankton. They feed the lowest in the food web. Coho and Chinook eat fish uh, as, a great, as a large part of their diet, higher in the food web. So from this red circle, they have the highest uh, trophic level, indicating that they do, in fact, feed higher in the food web. Uh, nutrients were generally consistent uh, across species, maybe a little bit lower for pinks for the fatty acids, but um, for all of the contaminants I've highlighted in, in red here, coho and chinook have the highest level of contaminants. And this, this is on a log scale, uh, and to get fit all the data on here, these changes are, are quite a bit larger uh, than, than they might appear in this graph. So food webs matter, uh, particularly for these persistent bioaccumulative contaminants that increase as you move up the food web. So, now how do we get thermometers and whales on the same scale? This graph's a little hard to explain. This is only the second time I've run through it, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to get not hung up in the weeds here, but talk about patterns. Across and so the short answer to how we got these things on the same scale is we, we converted everything to proportion. So we're dealing with percents instead of absolutes. That's step one. And then what we did for every year, we calculated the relative contribution of nutrients or contaminants that each species contributed to the total. And when you look at this graph, each you're like, what are these, what are these weird looking hoods? From the models we use, this is the posterior distribution of these models that, that we use to calculate the proportion. Each one of these has a line for each year. We're not, I'm not gonna talk about this interannual variability. And then the width of that hood is sort of the, the likelihood of uh, uh, the, the distribution of the data, but the top of each one of these is the median, all right? These, again, are scaled to proportions, and we ask the question, what is the relative contribution that you're bringing back of nutrients, the good stuff, or contaminants, the bad stuff? And then we, we're drawing this line here, this bright side to dark side line, and if you're on the left side of the line, you're bringing back relatively more. If you're on the right side, the uh, good stuff, if you're on the right side of this line, you're bringing back you know, more contaminants. And that's, I use this simple pink salmon cartoon. The way to think about this is for every percent gram of good stuff, I contributed percent gram of bad stuff, all right? Along the y-axis, we have species stacked by increasing trophic level. So pink's at the bottom, Chinook at the top. 
And the question is, yes, they are bringing back proportionally or disproportionately different um, good things and bad things. So on the right side of the line, we have uh, the top of the food web, salmon predators, Chinook and Coho. Uh, sockeye and Chum are sort of intermediate. If they're falling on the zero line, it means they're bringing about, about the same amount of good things and bad things. And pinks, feeding at the bottom of the food web with low contaminant profiles, but plenty of nutrients, are, are proportionately bringing back a brighter side subsidy uh, compared to animals that are living at the top of the food web. So I just want to summarize that initial question. Are they bringing back more of a bright side or a, good, or a dark side subsidy? Over the last 40 years, the salmon subsidy to the continent of North America has gotten both bigger and brighter. And so uh, here's our, uh, our community differences that are driving that. So on um, this top arrow shows relative amount of trophic biomagnification. And this bottom arrow, arrow is my you know, cartoony dark side, bright side uh, dichotomy. Pinks feeding at the bottom of the food web are on the bright side. The animals that are uh, biomagnifying more contaminants through this trophic uh, mechanism are on the dark side. And now let's go back to our escapement data. So in terms of metric tons per year, these were the trends by species in the amount of you know, salmon flesh returning to the continent was driven by pinks. And since pinks are on the bright side of, of, of this, of this, uh, this uh, little conceptual model, not only is it getting bigger over time, the pinks are driving it towards brighter. Okay, and I, um, I just want to end with a couple of uh, take home messages here. And I think the, what I have learned from trying to be integrating between these two disciplines is that contaminant, contaminants do affect organisms, uh, which we all know, and I think that's why many of us started, uh, got interested in studying them. But what I've been surprised about, even as an ecosystem ecologist, is that ecosystems affect contaminants, their fate, their transport, and their effects uh, in the environment. And my, my first message is, I guess, more of a plea for more interdisciplinary work is ecotoxicology benefits from the integration of ecosystem ecology frameworks and vice versa. You know, coming at this from, from an ecosystem person um, as, as my background, uh, working with my colleagues, I have learned so, I have learned not only so much about ecotoxicology, but the ideas of of how to integrate those to have a better understanding of of, of the way these chemicals behave in the environment and the ultimate outcomes that they have for the animals that live in them. And I, I guess I summarized a lot of that right here: uh, species biology, ecosystem processes, community dynamics, predator prey interactions affect these things. And context matters. So everything in the above point depends on the property of the chemicals themselves. Uh, bioaccumulation, elimination potential, how toxic they are, uh, that drives, ultimately drives the fate of these compounds in the environment. And you know, I, I really want to keep this talk a little bit more conceptual today. Uh, when I, I've given this at other times, I show a lot more of the application um, um, to risk management of contaminants in the environment. But I did want to end on, you know, this, the, the, this type of integration is being applied uh, in the field in, in various ways. And I think there, I'm just going to go ahead and stop and see if we have any questions. Any, any questions from the audience here in uh, the auditorium? So, so David, as an ecologist, one of the things that, that jumps out at me through this presentation is that life history strategies make a huge difference on mm -hmm. your contamination level. And it's intriguing to think about how that could ultimately uh, regulate you as a pr regulate the predator for you as a prey. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also has an impact of uh, some population dynamics. For example, uh, thinking about different sensitivities or sensitivity stages. Uh, so if eggs are really really sensitive, then there's a strong reason you would want to decrease that contamination level there. Right. Yeah, and that is true. And I, I think. You know, 
just from the insect example, figuring out that toxicity varies across life stage is not really, it's not integrated into tra traditional tox testing where the, the, the testing is done on the larvae or things like Daphnia that don't have complex life history. And, and so I think that's been sort of a, an interesting contribution of this work. And aquatic life criteria are supposed to be set on the most sensitive life stage, but they're all set for larvae for insects, which is interesting. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't get into today, but coming at it from a population perspective that we've been, we've talked for years about trying to model, is that from mesocosm experiments, we have seen repeatedly that if you, if you take wild populations of insects from the field and put them in an artificial stream that matches their home stream and they're just maturing away, and you start dripping a contaminant in, if they, are, if they can leave, they will leave. And so the emergence, the, they, the phenology totally changes where they emerge earlier. And they're smaller, and they have lower fecundity. So it'd be interesting to sort of build this type of response into population models, and not just for insects, but you know, for other things. It's the, the, the sublethal long-term population consequences of basically having to bail out. You know, and so uh, in the West, when we have things like pulsed exposures from uh, uh, release of mine waters, like we have, like in the Gold King is the classic example where you have this giant pulse, the things that can leave by flying away will. And, you know, so that has real consequences for the populations of those animals and the phenology of the predators because the, their food supply, the timing of their food supply is changing. So that's just one sort of nuance of, of that that I think goes into population dynamics as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that was really amazing. Thank um, you. I would be interested in kind of the return flux from all the predators consuming this contaminated prey, especially in aquatic systems, you know, when there's a transition towards terrestrial environments with insect emergence, are predators putting any of the contaminants back into the system when they die or by excreting mm -hmm. within the area? And kind of how does all of this map onto other um, existing, uh, you know, pressures like climate change, eutrophication affecting uh, ecosystems? Right, so the, the great questions and thank you for the compliment. So the first question is what are predators returning? And that is a really good question. And so it, it, it sort of depends on the predator so, for example, birds and bats, like swallows, uh, or birds like swallows and bats feed over the water and can feed rather continuously. And as so as they're eating, they're excreting. So there's that, that's one pathway of immediate return to water. Um, some animals that live, that might be feeding on land, like the frogs, you know, the frog example, they're, they're eating things from the air, <laughs> right, the flying insects, but they're either sitting in the water or right on the edge of the water, and they're returning all of that in, in excretion as well. So those are examples of things returning. Uh, I'm sorry, your second question was, oh, implications of things like climate change? Yeah, that's a great question, and one of the ways I've thought about climate change, particularly in the West, from those metal impacted streams is that when you heat, so two things happen with climate change that we're pretty sure of and that um, we're warming things up and that rainfall tends to be more intense. And so it's getting hotter and, and maybe not wetter everywhere, but like deluge wetter. And so that can all, those two things can alter chemical weathering rates. Right, and they're gonna, both of those things are gonna speed up chemical weathering. And so when you're dealing with a, an environmental impact like tailings piles, you know, where exposed rock is containing sulfuric acid and metals at the same time, that is going to absolutely increase the amount of contaminants delivered to the ecosystem. So that's one climate change example. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I have a quick question. Um, I don't think I'd heard of the 
term ecosystem subsidies before. How does that compare with ecosystem service? Right. So, eco so ecological subsidies, and I should have done a better job of defining this. That is, that is terminology borrowed from the economics world. I'm looking at you, Kevin. And that is, so it's just an economic subsidy is that there is more money in an economy because money is coming in from outside. So if the economy was standing by itself, there could only be so much production. But if, you, you, if outside money comes in, you can increase production. Ecological subsidies is the same concept. And that is, if you're in a forest, that forest can only be so productive based on the nutrients that are within that forest. And so it can only grow so many trees, so many bugs, and so many predators of bugs. But if you have a subsidy of the stream, adding a bag of money, in this case a bag of bug meat, you can grow more predators. You can increase production in that system. So that's the ecological subsidy. Ecological services is, you know, I, I, I don't want to define that more broadly because that's a pretty big umbrella. But an ecological service is saying this stream is, is uh, providing the service of diluting our treated wastewater. Okay. For and, humans. And, and that. Yeah. I consider a stream feeding animals on land that we care about, maybe like bats, endangered bats, or birds that people uh, you know, spend a lot of money to travel to watch. You know, Western tanager is an amazing bird that people travel. And they, they go to streams in the West when particular large emergence events are happening to, to key in on bird watching because when some of these Western rivers oh, are birds go bananas and people travel to see that. And so it's an ecosystem service and that is providing food for animals people care about and recreation for the people who care about those animals. Great, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I had another question too, if there's not any in the Zoom. Um, I was surprised that you have an increase in salmon flocks from 1975 to 2015 or the end of, so mm -hmm. it seems like things are getting better, at least in terms of salmon flocks. Mm -hmm. did, did that come at a cost to say diversity? Well, I, yeah, it came at a cost to the fishery. It came at a cost to the size of the fishery. And so in the, in the um, late 70s, early 80s, um, our, one of our co-authors on that, our colleague Greg uh, uh, Ruggeron, has been modeling these, these escapement returns for, uh, he's been working on it for 40 years. There was a big regime shift in the ocean that was driven by warming that, that sort of uh, flipped food webs and production writ large. And the consequences of that have been um, sort of winners and losers. And the losers are uh, the shrinking salmon. Uh, um, you know, it's a big loss for angling. Uh, I mean, people are still fishing, but they're not happy about, you know, they look back at the 60s and people are holding up king salmon <laughs> like this and their tail's on the ground, you know, and so there's that loss. Yeah. Um, there's been a loss uh, uh, in terms of uh, as pink salmon have been, so the, the, the salmon world, I have to be very careful because I live in Missouri and I'm a total <laughs> interloper, but there, there's some debate in the salmon world about what's causing the shrinking of the other fish. Uh, but if you, uh, if you regress the population of pink salmon against body sizes, it's always negative. And so there's some suspicion that as these marine systems have switched to having more plankton at the base of the food web, for example, that's caused a boom in pink salmon and it's coming to cost to the other salmon. It was hard to see on those graphs. Chinook have, Chinook have declined, not, uh, their population has stayed about the same, but they've shrunk a lot. So their total biomass coming onto the continent has actually reduced. And so I, I, I think there's, there's definitely been winners and losers in that. And for the commercial industry, um, you know, uh, pinks are not, 
you might have guessed from that slide, pinks are not the tastiest. Mm. You know, they don't serve, or if you see pinks in the restaurant, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't start there. Um, uh, they, they have the least amount of lipid, the least amount of fatty acids, mm. et cetera. And so there's been that, that shift in, it's come at a gastronomic cost. Yeah, great. And one last one. Uh, so reduction in contaminant flux, is that because we're doing a better job controlling pollution since the 70s? Or is it mainly driven by the change in species? It's driven by the change in species. And um, w one thing that's you know, a little bit hard to get into the, de the details there is, and, and the reason we, we have those, I also didn't peek under the hood of our big fancy Bayesian models <laughs> that are behind those curves, but we, we don't have enough contaminant data for all species in all regions to say, to look at trends and contaminants. And so what we had to do was put it all in a modeling framework that could get that uncertainty. We have less uncertainty about the escapement numbers, right? But when we do a sensitivity analysis of the models, the changes, the changes in concentrations are tens of parts per billion, right? You know, it, makes, it takes a billion parts per billion to make a gram. The changes in fish are like 73,000 metric tons. So when you do a sensitivity analysis on it, the changes in concentration over time have almost no effect on the, the changes in fluxes. It's the changes in fish. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I think we'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.